Les da bienvenida, veo muchos amigos, eh, muchos conocidos de, de largo tiempo en el sector eh, y de la, también de la Comisión, eh, Comisión Nacional de los Mercados y la Competencia y de la Comisión Nacional de Energía antes. Es para mí, como digo, un, un placer darles la bienvenida para un, un, un acto que creo que tiene gran relevancia, como es la presentación del informe anual que hace la Agencia de Cooperación de los Reguladores de Energía eh, sobre la supervisión de los mercados de electricidad y gas en Europa. Y, es, y sobre todo lo primero, eh, agradecer eh, a Alberto Potosni el, el esfuerzo de hacer esta presentación de este informe, que es la primera vez que se hace fuera de su sede habitual en Bruselas. Este informe es uno de los resultados de la agencia, eh, a nuestro juicio, de mayor importancia para todos los operadores y para todo el sector y para la sociedad también en general. Cuando Funsean y Joan Batalla se acerca para, para a nosotros, a ELEC, para mm, comunicarnos esta posibilidad, nosotros encantados y por eso tenemos que agradecer también a Joan y a Maite Costa el que Funsean cuente para hacer este seminario de invierno de esta importancia y esta presentación con AELEC. La Agencia de Cooperación de los Reguladores de la Energía, que fue creada en el, en, a través del Reglamento 713 del 2009, es uno de los elementos integrantes del tercer paquete, ese tercer paquete que, de energía que, en el que hemos vivido, que, que establece los elementos de regulación y que va a ser completado con el plaquete de invierno a partir de este año. Eh, entre los elementos que tiene de profundización del mercado interior establece un elemento de una enorme relevancia, que es la creación de una agencia de cooperación de reguladores. Agencia de cooperación de reguladores que fue desde, la, desde las autoridades reguladoras nacionales, en aquel momento desde la Comisión Nacional de Energía, vivida con gran ilusión, porque es uno de los objetivos que tiene la agencia de cooperación, es asistir a las autoridades reguladoras nacionales. Uno de los elementos integrantes del modelo que tenemos, y el modelo que tenemos es el modelo europeo de mercado interior de electricidad y gas, es la existencia de autoridades reguladoras nacionales. Y la creación de una autoridad reguladora de esta agencia a nivel europeo que asiste a los demás reguladores y que se encarga del conocimiento adecuado y de que se aplica adecuadamente el derecho europeo es un elemento, es una herramienta, es una palanca de la, para la consecución de los objetivos del mercado interior. Esa agencia que surge en los primeros trabajos de Erger y de CER en el 2007 con un objetivo concreto que es solucionar, muy concreto y muy específico, los conflictos en el comercio transfronterizo que había un gap que no podían resolver las autoridades reguladoras nacionales, al crearse, y ya en el reglamento del 2009, se le atribuyen otra serie de funciones. Y una función, y una de las funciones más importantes, que luego se complementa con el REMIT, es la supervisión de los mercados de electricidad y gas. Los informes de supervisión, y este es el que presentamos del 2017, referido a 2017, los informes de supervisión son un exponente de uno de los objetivos que deben cumplir los reguladores, que es la transparencia, el proporcionar información a los agentes, a los mercados, a los, a, 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 a los académicos, a la sociedad en general, de cómo funcionan los mercados. Tiene un valor, eh, un valor inapreciable, o inconstatable, enorme para todos los que operan en el sector y es la base en muchas ocasiones de eh, las propuestas normativas y de las reformas que se realizan desde el punto de vista normativo y desde el punto de vista europeo. Por eso este informe, pues a mí personalmente me parece importantísimo. También a Fusean y es de agradecer que se presente aquí que Alberto nos lo vaya a exponer ahora. Y más en el momento en el que estamos. ¿En qué momento estamos? Pues en un cambio de paradigma, en un momento de transición ecológica, de transición energética, en que cambian los sectores. Saber los datos de, de los mercados en este momento de cambio es, por tanto, un pasamento, una piedra de, de, de base para poder seguir funcionando. Y desde ELEC, y también quiero decir, estamos firmemente convencidos de los objetivos y trabajamos para ello, para conseguir esos elementos esenciales sin olvidar, y por eso estamos en el marco europeo y en el modelo en el que estamos. Un mercado cada vez más integrado y cada vez más competitivo. Ella será los, el elemento que permita a los agentes tomar sus decisiones en el, en, 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 en el nuevo modelo para conseguir esos objetivos. El informe, se, y lo presentará Alberto, tiene cuatro volúmenes, Mercado Mayorista de Electricidad, Mercado mercado mayorista de gas, mercado minorista y un último elemento que está presente ya en, la, en el tercer paquete y que está más presente aún en el modelo al que vamos, que es protección del consumidor, consumidores y empoderamiento del consumidor. Ese papel del consumidor, qué herramientas tiene el consumidor para poder actuar en ese modelo. 
Simplemente voy a señalar tres eh, ideas de alguno de estos, de estos, de estos, de estos elementos. En, el, en cuanto al mercado mayorista, se recoge la práctica total, el, 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 un incremento generalizado de los precios en la práctica totalidad de los mercados europeos. Se señalan los elementos y los retos del acoplamiento y de mayor eficiencia en el uso de las interconexiones. Y hay margen de mejora en estas actuaciones. Se está avanzando en la consecución del mercado intradiario continuo, en los servicios de balance y hay proyectos como Mario Terre que permiten o van a permitir armonizar la regulación secundaria de los mercados de balance y mejorar el funcionamiento de nuestros mercados. La homogenización de los mercados, de que el mercado español, el mercado español, el mercado ibérico, mejor dicho, de España y Portugal, avancen hacia ese modelo europeo, es uno de los elementos más significativos. Y en el informe se resalta la convergencia de precios con Portugal en el, y, y en una diferencia de precios media con Francia de 7,3 euros megavatio, en el que cuenta mucho también el cáter impositivo que tiene en España. En este, modelo, en este punto no podemos olvidar también la existencia como uno de los elementos de diseño del mercado mayorista de los mecanismos de capacidad. Los grandes países europeos, como Bélgica, Francia, Alemania, Grecia, Italia y Polonia, tienen aprobados de acuerdo y contrastado su, sus sistemas de capacidad sus, en relación con el derecho europeo. Y han sido, tienen la supervisión de, eh, de, del derecho europeo. España carece aún de un mecanismo que cuente con el respaldo exigido por la Comisión Europea. Creo que todos tenemos que trabajar en esa línea de conseguir un mecanismo de capacidad que dé las señales adecuadas de inversión de futuro en el sistema español que no lo, que no lo tenemos aún. En relación con el mercado minorista, en el cual se aprecian los precios que pagan los consumidores, destaca la caída en en Europa el precio de la electricidad que pagan tanto consumidores como domésticos. Se señala también el ranking que ocupa el precio en España de los consumidores domésticos y también de los consumidores industriales y que se encuentran fundamentalmente en, en, una, en, en, en una banda sensiblemente mejor que los domésticos. Pero lo que sí quiero señalarles es que del resultado de la evolución de estos costes que refleja el informe, los costes de las redes solo representan el 22% y, y, y es uno de los valores más bajos de todos los valores de los otros países de la Unión Europea. El coste de la generación y el coste de las redes son el 62% de la factura y el 38% corresponde a impuestos y a otros costes que vienen, a otros cargos que se incorporan a la factura. El elemento de que el precio sea un precio ajustado y sea un precio eficiente es es uno de los elementos, a nuestro juicio, claves del momento en el que estamos. Los objetivos de descarbonización hacen que vayamos a una sociedad electrificada. La, eh, una mayor electrificación, es imposible conseguir objetivos de descarbonización sin una mayor electrificación. Y los precios de la electricidad juegan un papel importante en ese elemento. No puede ser un, 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 ocasionar un retraimiento en la consecución de esos objetivos en relación con la descarbonización. Y, finalmente, una última palabra para algo que es, a nuestro juicio, importante también que es el empoderamiento del consumidor y la protección del consumidor. Desde la agencia, desde CER, desde, desde la, la comisión reguladora se ha trabajado mucho en el tema de protección del consumidor, reclamaciones, homogenización de reclamaciones, plazo de reclamaciones. Pero hay un elemento también enormemente importante, el empoderamiento del consumidor, el que el consumidor pueda decidir en un momento en el que vamos hacia un autoconsumo, en el que el consumidor eh, consume e inyecta a la vez en, en, en las propias redes. Y allí uno de los elementos que señala, y quiero ponerlo de relevancia porque España en esto estamos bien, ese elemento de los contadores digitales. De los nueve, solo nueve países han alcanzado, nueve países europeos, han alcanzado el 50% del de despliegue de los contadores. España teníamos un plan en que en diciembre del 2018, un plan de hace años establecido con una serie de escalas en el tiempo, pero que culminaba en diciembre del 2018, había que estar implantados los contadores digitales. Los contadores digitales están de prácticamente el 100%, implantados en España. Las empresas distribuidoras han conseguido esos objetivos y nos sitúan en un elemento de vanguardia en la Unión Europea para que el consumidor pueda ejercer esos poderes o pueda esos poderes, esas capacidades. Un consumidor que conoce, un consumidor que sabe los datos de su consumo, es un consumidor que ahorra, es un consumidor eficiente, es un consumidor que contribuye a los objetivos de descarbonización. Esto, por, ya no, no quiero extenderme más, creo que el, el informe es absolutamente importante para el, el desempeño de nuestra función. Muchas gracias a Alberto, muchas gracias a Acer por realizar este trabajo, por desplegar y por permitirnos conocer cuál es el estado y la comparación de los, de, de, de los mercados de electricidad y gas. Perdón, no me he referido al gas. Hay importantísimos datos de gas, pero estamos en AELEC, estamos en AELEC y, por tanto, me he referido a los, a, 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 a los temas eléctricos. Pero la relevancia
relevancia es igual de importante para el mercado del gas. Y nada, y muchas gracias por su asistencia. Gracias, gracias Marina. Buenos días a todos, amigos, amigas. La verdad es que, como decía Marina, es un placer estar aquí con todos ustedes. La verdad es que cuando nos planteamos ahora, pues ya cerca de siete, ocho meses, la posibilidad de intentar convencer a Alberto a que viniera a presentar lo que era el informe, la verdad es que nos hacía una especial ilusión, sobre todo por dos motivos. Uno, porque siempre es un placer tener a Alberto y con el motivo, además, de presentar el Market Monitoring Report. El segundo era por el tema de que este es el veinteavo eh, seminario que organizamos desde FUNSEAM. A lo largo de estos seis años, más allá de las otras actividades que ya conocéis, hemos realizado 20 seminarios de diferentes temáticas, de diferentes ámbitos, con diferentes protagonistas, con diferentes ponentes todos de gran relevancia. Y nos hacía una especial ilusión el tema de los mercados eléctricos y gasistas, ya no únicamente, como decía Marina, por nuestro pasado regulador, sino también por el tema de que somos conscientes, no únicamente de la relevancia que tienen en estos momentos los mercados, sino también de la relevancia que van a tener en los próximos años, y especialmente en este contexto de transición energética. Por eso, agradecerte, Alberto, pues que nos acompañes, y además con el motivo de la presentación de, del funcionamiento, que nos llena, la verdad, es que de un especial, de un especial honor y de cariño teniendo en cuenta de que ya es la tercera actuación o actividad en la que contamos con tu participación. Yo, revisando estos 20 seminarios, recordaba de que ya en el 2015 participaste especialmente con motivo de la, del análisis de la situación de las infraestructuras eh, energéticas a nivel europeo. Y recuerdo hace dos años en el simposio en Barcelona que, pues, cuando se estaba debatiendo precisamente el papel y los nuevos poderes que se le otorgaba a la agencia, pues viniste a compartir todos toda tu visión y todos tus conocimientos. Más allá de lo que son los contenidos interesantísimos de, del informe, del Market Monitoring Report, que como muy bien señalaba Marina, son de extrema relevancia, tanto para el gasista como para el eléctrico, para no solaparme, yo lo que sí que quisiera reseñar es el tema del momento en que se produce no únicamente esta presentación, sino también lo que es el análisis que realiza excelentemente todos los años la agencia conjuntamente con, con CER. A nivel europeo, a nivel español obviamente lo estamos viviendo, pero a nivel europeo estas últimas semanas han sido intensas en lo que es la definición de la hoja de ruta, de la estrategia a seguir en los próximos años. Ya vimos a finales de noviembre que se publicaba lo que era la visión estratégica a largo plazo hacia una economía próspera, moderna, competitiva y neutra en emisiones, donde la Comisión Europea ponía de manifiesto cuáles tenían que ser los, graf, los grandes rasgos de esa transición energética en el horizonte no del 2030, sino también del 2050. Pero es que además, pocos días antes de, de Navidades, nos llegó la satisfactoria noticia de que se había culminado el proceso de negociaciones entre los Estados miembros, la Comisión Europea y el Parlamento acerca de lo que era el Clean Energy Package, con lo cual pues este año 2019 será un año intenso de culminación en la redacción de las directivas e inicio del trámite de transposición a lo que es en los marcos normativos de cada uno de los, de los Estados miembros. Obviamente no es el objeto de, de esta presentación ni de de este seminario entrar en detalle en los contenidos de ambos documentos, de ambas estrategias, lo único que sí que me permitirán que apunte es que un rasgo común, tanto de la estrategia, de la visión estratégica a largo plazo, como de lo que es el documento, el acuerdo definitivo a nivel político acerca del Clean Energy Package, es la poner de relieve la relevancia que van a tener los mercados. Un nuevo mercado energético se apunta, obviamente, como la necesidad de, eh, o como el elemento catalizador de la integración de, un mayor, de una mayor participación de renovables, pero al mismo tiempo garantizando la seguridad de suministro y, obviamente, con elevados grados de competencia. Por eso es de gran relevancia informes o estudios como los que se presentan hoy. El hecho de poder saber cuál ha sido el funcionamiento, cuáles son los ámbitos de mejora en ese comportamiento de los agentes de los mercados, tanto a nivel mayorista como a nivel minorista para el sector eléctrico y el gasista, y obviamente sin descontar lo que es el papel de los consumidores los grandes protagonistas de esta transición energética nos parecía de gran relevancia por eso agradecerte una vez más Alberto tu participación, yo tenía previsto hacer unas breves últimas palabras de presentación de Alberto, yo creo que no es necesario presentar a Alberto le conocemos todos no, no es boring, lo único que sí que quisiera decir es que a lo largo de todo su trabajo en, en ACER yo creo que ha sido el artífice de que Acer se haya convertido en estos años en una entidad central 
eh, independiente a la que le compete lo que es la cooperación, la supervisión de los mercados y obviamente han sido muchos los logros y avances que se han producido. Probablemente los resultados que apuntaba Marina a la hora de destacar lo más reseñable de la situación de los mercados no hubiera sido posible sin esa tarea que ha realizado a lo largo de estos, de estos últimos años. Por lo tanto, agradecerte este trabajo, especialmente para aquellos que creemos en el mercado, que somos defensores del mercado y del papel que tienen que desempeñar en este proceso de transición energética. Ya sin más, te cedo la palabra y comentaros que al final de la presentación, como es habitual en los seminarios, habrá un pequeño tiempo para lo que es debate, con lo cual os rogaría si podéis guardar las preguntas para, para el final de la presentación. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Juan. Muchas gracias, Marina. Agradezco mucho la invitación de Aileken de Funsem y de profesora Costa y de estar aquí para presentar los, uh, algunos de los resultados de nuestra actividad de monitoraje del mercado mayorista y minorista de la energía en Europa. Um, con su permiso voy a continuar en inglés, con lo que me encuentro más cómodo, especialmente cuando se trata de Asuntos técnico. Está bien. So, thanks a lot. Um, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I lived here for a number of years in the past, but now for 10 years I've been in Ljubljana, where we don't use a lot of Spanish. Even though I can tell you afterwards, uh, Spanish is is getting more and more known in 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 um, in, in, in Slovenia. And actually, you, you hear people. Slovenians talking in Spanish, but that's a different thing. <laughs> Marina has already, has already basically presented the report for what concerns Spain. Um, so, uh, no, in, in fact, my, my, my idea was to give uh, more of a European, because I'm sure that you, all of you know more about Spain than I do. So, uh, try, to see, to, try to put the, perspective, the European perspective into seeing what are the achievements, a lot, uh, the challenging, still significant, Uh, in, in the process for uh, creating an internal electricity and gas market. And we start with gas, by the way, so. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, wh where are we going? And um, as one was saying, um, there is now the clean energy package. Our results refer to 2017. Um, it takes us a year almost to, to, to come up with the report because obviously first we need to collect the numbers, then we need to analyze, verify them, come up with a story, I mean, what they mean, and, and then publish it. So it's a long process. We've tried to compress it, but it's difficult. So, uh, however, m many of the trends are long, sort of long to medium term trends. So they're, 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 you know, they're, they're still current, and the problem was still, they're still there. The challenges are still there. So um, this is uh, as a matter of introduction. Um, now, let me therefore start with, uh, with, uh, with the gas market. This is actually a slide that is one of the slides that I like the most. This is, uh, uh, gives an impression of where, how the integration of the gas market is progressing. And this is of direct relevance to consumers. Because these are actually a, a, our estimate of the sourcing costs of gas by suppliers in different member states. We've done it every year. Uh, here I've only obviously, you know, I, I could have come with a lot of small charts but I, I just thought of doing two larger charts. And this is basically what has happened over the last five years. Uh, the cut, wow, sorry, something is, okay. The colors, uh, the, um, we are looking at the average sourcing cost for suppliers in different jurisdictions with respect to the TTF, which is the most liquid market in, uh, in continental Europe. And uh, the yellow means that you are within one euro per megawatt hour. The, um, the, 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 the light blue, it means that you are within three euros, and the dark blue is beyond. And as you see, in the five years, there is, uh, in, in, now with respect to five years ago, there is a lot of more yellow, which means that the sourcing cost of suppliers of gas to final consumers are actually getting closer and closer across Europe. And one thing that I find it very interesting is that the yellow expands not from the east to the west. I mean, most of the gas is still coming from the east. We have to accept this. Uh, or to the south. But it's actually expanding out from the most competitive 
uh, market in Europe, which means that competition does more than proximity to the, to the sources, which is, I think, the, you know, it, it's, a, it's a proof, if, if you want, that the recipe of Europe of trying to promote competition is actually paying out. And uh, this, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, and we also notice that um, there are, uh, th there is more competition, the, 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 the result, I don't know why this moves, but it's all, it's getting bored. Uh, the, the, you know, the results are linked to improvements uh, in uh, gas hub price conversions. <coughs> so the, 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 the the promotion of gas hubs in different member states is paying off. And I, I'll actually, I have a chart later on as to the, the, the still varied pictures of the um, level of maturity of gas hubs in Europe. So this is just to give you an impression. The market is starting, well, is delivering. Okay, we don't have yellow all the way yet, but you know, we have a lot more yellow today than we had five years ago when you know, the process started. If you think the network codes uh, you know, the, 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 the third package, 2009, implementation started in 2011. The network codes uh, arrived in 2015. So there has been, they're, they're starting to deliver. And actually, part of the focus of this year's report is are the network codes delivering? You know, are, is, are they delivering not only in terms of formal implementation, but also in terms of the impact that we will expect them to have? So. This is you know, just a matter of background. As I said, the, there, are, there are good messages behind here. There is uh, more upstream competition when you have hubs. Um, you have uh, uh, the hub model is actually developing uh, across Europe. Some hubs are actually, we, we, we see it later on, are actually developing, but others are actually, other jurisdictions are taking advantage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, existing hubs by, by taking advantage of uh, more infrastructure available and the better use of this infrastructure. However, the picture in Europe is quite diverse. And there are still areas where we need to look into because we don't have yet a satisfactory market environment. Now, this seems to be going with it of its own accord. I don't know why. So either I speed up or, it's, or I would try. Anyway, um, so if we look at various markets, you know, um, there are... The, the, the CR started in 2011 with, uh, with, uh, with developing, with developing, I'm sorry, something, with developing a, a gas target model. And then um, the agency in 2015 upgraded that, f uh, or revised that uh, gas target model. And we looked at a number of metrics of how the uh, market, uh, you know, of the uh, health of the different markets, and clearly the concentration of the markets and the, what we call the residual supply index, is the market able to still to function without the incumbent supply, the, the larger supply? Because obviously if the larger supply is uh, necessary, it's, uh, you know, the market cannot function, then it has more power than otherwise. And therefore, you know, in a sense, we would like, uh, you know, we, we believe that um, with our with, the, with um, the implementation of dental codes and the structural reforms, uh, markets should move uh, to the left and up. So they, have a, um, they will have a lower um, uh, concentration, so the level of the um, Hirschman Health Index should be uh, low, below, say, 2,000, and then a high, um, a high uh, uh, index for uh, suppliers, i.e. Uh, the market within the incumbent should still be able to be served and with a margin. And as you see over the years, uh, a lot of markets have moved up and, and to the left, which is actually what we want to see. And I think this is, you know, it's an excellent message. It seems that the most difficult, uh, the most difficult um, target to achieve is market concentration, because market concentration obviously has to do also with the way in which the market functions. Now, I'm going now faster than... Now, when we look at markets, however, there is still, as I said, a very varied pictures. There are some markets, some uh, markets in some jurisdictions have a very long horizon for trading. Um, well, in fact, only two of them have um, very long. It's, uh, and we, this has been uh, something, still the case, has been a 
persistent finding, not surprisingly. This is TTF and uh, NBP, TTF in uh, the Netherlands and NBP in the UK. They are, you, in these markets, you have liquidity, which goes several um, you know, years uh, out. In most other markets, um, you know, usually it's just a spot, spot trade that is... Sorry, this is really embarrassing, but I don't know why. Uh, so, the, so the challenge for us is actually to try to make sure that either other jurisdictions link to these markets or that other markets develop so that there are hedging opportunities also for, um, for, for, for shippers, for, for operators, for suppliers, uh, for gas uh, producers in these other markets. So again, um, trying to develop the hubs is uh, one of the main uh, um, objective of, uh, of, of the network codes and of the activity of the agency because they also bring benefits as we've seen on our, in other respects. So let's see the hubs where we are at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we have a uh, well-functioning hub in Western Europe. We have well-functioning hub in, hubs in, in, in Northern Europe. We still have a problem in Southeast Europe. And uh, this is actually uh, a, a source of concern. Uh, there are no hubs. Uh, it's also difficult for them to have access to our hubs. Some of the, co some of the sourcing costs that we've seen are quite low, but just because there is local, local, uh, local gas and sometimes also there is um, um, state intervention in these markets. So I think you know, uh, we have to look how to either merge or integrate markets where you cannot, have, you cannot achieve the liquidity in these markets by themselves. Uh, this can be done formally or it can be done de facto. In any case, developing and improving the access to infrastructure has to be uh, one of the recipes uh, for this. Talking about infrastructure, we have here uh, what happens with, uh, with the use of the infrastructure. Actually, I would say better with the booking of that infrastructure. Then we come to the use a bit later on. Uh, we come from a legacy of long-term contracts. Most of the infrastructure was locked into long-term contracts when we started to work. And those of you who have followed the debate in Europe, there was, uh, you know, when we, one of the first network codes that we developed was the one on capacity creation mechanism, and there was a long debate how much capacity should be left for short-term allocation. Now, in the end, not much, but enough to start a trend, to start a, no, I think it's the presentation, uh, to start a trend whereby, now, the, uh, the blue part is capacity booked on the basis of long-term contracts, then the top part is uh, the, the, the yellow and the, the lighter blue is, is actually based on shorter term allocation. And as you see, the share is, is a very sh um, slow process because you have to wait for contracts to come to the end of their term. But as you see, a lot more is actually allocated through short term, which means that this is actually something that um, shippers um, like because at the moment the, 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 the markets are more dynamic and they are quite reluctant to take long-term commitments uh, on capacity. Actually, in fact, at some stage, they try to get out of the commitment on, on the existing, or their existing commitment to capacity. And uh, I think you know, this is actually one of, of the ways in, in which you make more competition because you, make more you, know, you, you allow the market to respond, to allow the, um, the user of capacity to respond to market signal. So this is, again, a very, to me, is a very positive is one of the very positive outcome of the process. It's not a process that is completed by, by me, but at least we see that you know, the capacity location mechanism and the um, congestion management guidelines, they're actually delivering uh, what was intended, i.e. to make this market more dynamic or to allow the market to become more dynamic, dynamic by freeing up infrastructure. Uh, this is actually also confirmed. If you look, this is a specific case. This is the German-Austrian uh, the German Austrian border, and this basically we are comparing uh, the level of booking <coughs> utilization. As you see, uh, there is uh, there is uh, I mean the, the level of uh, firm booking has uh, decreased. But if you see also how this is booked, uh, you see that more and more, and actually probably the trend here is much faster than in the other case more and more is actually booked on a short-term basis, uh, which uh, gives the 
you know, gives the opportunity, gives opportunity for traders to take advantage of price signals, which was not, we, we see the same thing in electricity actually, which until recently was not, you know, the, it, was, it was a very um, constrained, uh, there were very constrained market because uh, their interlinkage was actually based on, on, on long-term contracts. So first there was only a few um, shippers who could take benefits of any arbitrage opportunity between markets. And second one, it was very difficult to take advantage of short-term price differentials, which now is actually happening. And as we see, also the utilization we, in response to uh, short-term <coughs> short signal is, 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 is increasing. Uh, the, 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 yearly the yearly average utilization is increasing, but also the utilization when there are uh, uh, higher price spreads. So this is, again, is the other, the other side of the same coin. Capacity is available, and it has been used. It has been used to uh, take advantage of price differentials. And this is also a way of making the market to converge, the price, the price to converge, because if you can arbitrate or arbitrage between the, the different markets, then that's what you have. Finally, and I think this is my last slide for gas, if I'm, yeah. Um, there's been a lot of work done on, on balancing because if you want to have a shorter term market you also need to improve the way in which the market is balanced or you know, the mechanism through which markets are balanced and, um, and, and uh, the balancing network code you might know gives uh, more responsibility or aims to give more responsibility to balance the system to, um, to users of the market and not to, um, not to TSO. So the TSO should really have a residual role. Uh, this is the intention. Uh, not yet there. There are still some jurisdictions whereby the, um, whereby the, the TSO, in Germany the TSO still plays a, a very large role. But that's not the idea. The idea is that when it comes to real time, Shippers should have been able to balance their position. And how you do that? By giving more responsibility and more opportunities to shippers through short-term markets. As you see, we have a varied picture again, but in some countries, and you know, the, the Iberian Peninsula is one example, the role of the, uh, of the, role of the gas TSO <coughs> is, is already quite, quite limited and it could be more limited in the future. So again, the measures that were put in place, not only in the balancing network codes, but also to make sure that capacity is used in a more efficient way and can be booked on a shorter term basis, is actually delivering. So this is another very, is actually empowering the, the, the shippers and give more price signals for balancing. Because you know, uh, shippers react to price signals. TSOs have sometimes you know, other ways of procuring uh, balancing gas. So, this is also quite, quite a positive message that we have from, from, from the efforts that have been put in place over the last years to try to make this market uh, more competitive. So this is, the, this is the, a very short summary of the main uh, messages that we get from, the, from our uh, monitoring activities for the, for, the, for the wholesale gas market. Now I'm turning to electricity. Then I will look at the sort of um, retail market. I will not cover consumer protection. Um, the main reason is because you know CR is, is responsible for, for, for developing it, and uh, also I think you know the, the focus on the market. This is where actually uh, the network codes are trying to um, are try to, um, to, to to improve the situation. At the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in where delivering, where we are delivering um, benefits to consumers. But we will see that through sort of prices, etc. So let's see where we are. I guess all of you know where we are in terms of um, market integration. This is the uh, day ahead picture where uh, we have now basically two macro areas. We have the price cap in the regions in Western and Northern Europe going from the Straits of Gibraltar, Portugal, all the way to the Scandinavian countries, um, and, uh, and, uh, and and then we have another another area in uh, in west in um, Eastern Europe, the four MMC, um, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. They are using the same algorithm, 
but at the moment there are, they are not coupled with the rest. The issue has to do with, uh, on the implementation of flow-based uh, capacity calculation. Hopefully there is a project that was just launched a few weeks ago that might deliver this integration. But I think, you know, we can, we can already claim that a substantial part of the market, and actually this geographical coverage for the day at market was uh, achieved already um, some years ago. So uh, at some stage you might recall that there was, uh, you know, this, this, this target of delivering the internal energy market by the end of 2014. We delivered almost this picture a few months um, after 14. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's um, I can't say job done, but we are, we, are, we, are, we are well on the way. Intraday, in June, you might know that the XBIT market started. Uh, it doesn't have the same wider coverage, but we are confident that uh, it can progress and uh, expand its coverage. Uh, just one, uh, one indication, I mean, one very tangible indication. You may know that under REMIT, the Regulation on Energy Market Integrity and Transparency, we collect all trades and orders to trade in Europe. And with the X speed, we increase 50% the number of record transactions which are reported to the agency. Which means that this is quite an active market. I'll come to that later on. From 2 million a day to 3 million a day. So at the moment, we are collecting 3 million records of transactions in order to trade. And the jump uh, happened halfway through last year when X speed came. So it's, it's an important market. I mean, we wouldn't need to wait for this to, to realize it. If you have more renewables, you need to be able to trade closer to real time. Forecast of renewable production, I'm sure there are some of you that comes from that industry, is getting better and better. But still, you can't rely only on the day at market. You, 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 you want to rely, you, 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 you are entitled to rely on a well-functioning cross-border market. And is the cross-border is the cross-border market important for, for, for intraday trading? Yes, it is. And I'll come to that a bit later on. So, now, as I mentioned beforehand, the proof of the pudding is in, not in the eating, but on how much we can deliver to consumers. This is but basically, this is the only slide when I have a billion, actually no, I have a few, another one, but this is one. Uh, just by integrating the market between 13 and, uh, um, and now, basically, we are delivering 1 billion euros to European consumers in terms of better utilization of the available capacity. At, with the same level of capacity, there hasn't been much added to it, I have to say, until now. A bit, but not much. With this, basically using the same level. By using it better, you see, you see here in the bottom, you see here that you know, we started around 60, now we are 85%. So we are using the interconnector better in an efficient way. What happened in the past is in many, on many borders, I mean, we have, a, sorry, we have a better picture here where we are. But in many borders, electricity was going in the wrong direction. It was going from where it is more expensive to produce where, to where the price is lower. This is actually open the window, taking the money and throwing it out. Why is that? Because there was no mechanism for coordinating the allocation of capacity with uh, uh, electricity trading. And this is what market coupling has delivered. It has delivered a, by construction, automatic mechanism to make sure that electricity only goes from where, in an efficient, moves in an efficient way, let's put it this way, from where it is cheaper to produce to where it is most valuable. If you look in the report, there is a, there is a chart where this is not yet the case. And if you look at borders where this is not the case, are the borders where market capital is not there. There are some borders bet um, in, uh, between, uh, um, between Ireland and the UK, some Swiss border, some borders between the two areas that I mentioned before, the, 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 the blue and, and, and the... Sorry, yeah, the blue and, and, and the yellow, yellow-ish, I think it's. Uh, so on those borders, there are still a number of hours where we send the electricity in the wrong way. And that's no one's fault. It's just the impossibility of, um, of, of reconciling uh, booking of capacity with the outcome of, of energy trading. This is not just a pity, it's just, as I said. And it's, it's throwing money, money, money out of the window. And our estimate is that if we were to complete, there are still a number of borders where market capital does not operate. If we were able to complete this work, then we would probably 
um, provide consumers with savings in the order of probably a quarter of a, mil of, of a billion, something like that. Now, a billion, it's, uh, you know, if you divide by the total electricity bill in Europe, is 0.000, .000 you know, there are a lot of zeros. <laughs> but the difference between having and not having a billion, to me, is still a billion. And because this is not about building infrastructure, this is about improving the way in which this infrastructure is used. It's mostly sort of software procedure, these kind of things. And it doesn't cost a billion a year to run or even to develop this. I mean, market coupling has costed a lot more than, I remember the first estimate, this would cost two million. We're not, we are a multiple of that. X bit the same. But, you know, we're delivering one billion a year. We can deliver more. And at the end, I have a, have a slide with, um, with, you know, with, with other numbers. Uh, which we estimate. They are all rough estimates. Okay, so, so the day ahead market, we are quite content because uh, I think, you know, if we were able to complete the, complete the, 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 the coupling on the other borders, I'm sure we will be able to get to very close to 100%. These numbers refer to before XBIT came into force, so there is still room for improving the intraday market, the efficient use of utilization, the efficient utilization of uh, in, uh, capacity in the intraday time frame. We're halfway through, and there is still a lot to do for, for, for balancing. But uh, I guess most of, the, most of the trading, most of the exchanges will actually happen in, uh, in the intraday and uh, um, in the, sorry, in the, in the day I had the intraday market. Uh, now, one, those of you who have, who have followed us, know that over the last few years we've been insisting on uh, improving the amount of capacity which is made available to the market. And our impression is that at the moment uh, there, is, there is a lot more than can be done in order to give the market sufficient capacity. Now, our results have been heavily criticized by TSOs. I accept the fact that you know, our estimates are not as accurate as the one that TSOs can come up with. But I also have to say that we can be a few percentage off, but if you say that if you see that at the moment uh, capacity is used only sorry capacity is made available to the market at a rate of around fifty percent of what could be done uh, by maintaining security uh, of operation, then even if you are a few percentage off, there is still a strong message to be given that this can be improved now there are various elements to this, and uh, I would like here to, let me see if I can stop this. Go. Now, there are two, there are two issues here. Uh, one is a legacy issue. Capacity calculation until now has been based on, I would say almost a pre-market. I'm sure TSOs would disagree, but basically the cross-border capacity was the residual element in the security supply, security operational security <laughs> equation. So first you make sure that you have security in your own area, and then if there was the opportunity to leave some capacity for cross-border exchanges, well, that would be <coughs> given to cross-border exchanges. So there was, there was discrimination in how these, the, the internal, the, the capacity for internal exchanges and the capacity for cross-border exchanges were treated in the allocation within the capacity calculations <coughs> within, uh, uh, within each jurisdiction. With the result that, as I said, the, 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 the cross-border capacity was the residual element in this equation. Now, this should not be the case. If we want really to have an internal market, we should treat um, internal, intrazonal and cross-zonal exchange in the same way. We have zones because the system the, the physics of the system is such that we don't have unlimited capacity between different areas, so we need to have zones. We need to have efficient congestion management, but beyond this, there should not be discrimination. And as I said, we found that uh, there was uh, significant discrimination. On the right-hand side, you actually see uh, you know, a map of Europe where most of the countries, they have other issues of uh, capacity not being uh, offer to the market to the extent that uh, we should do, or you know the the, the this coming up to with to, with a high price spread, which is probably higher than what would be justified if we have a a, a 
a optimal um, capacity, an optimal allocation of capacity. The, uh, the, the, the situation in Europe is, uh, is, is quite varied. I would say this part of Europe is, is performing better than average. There are other parties which are performing even better. But in, there are some areas, for example, if you look at the known CWE core or South, South, Southeast Europe, well, that, then the, the uh, amount of capacity which is made available to the market compared to what could be made available, not the thermal capacity, compared to what could be made available in a secure manner is, is, is minimal. Now, um, this is actually something that we've been working on because we think, you know, together with making sure that uh, electricity goes in the right direction uh, is, is, is a matter of utmost concern because it's basically not, not using what we have. We issued in, the, at the, in, um, in 2016 a recommendation to try to improve the capacity calculation mechanisms, um, which is basically where part of the problem comes. And I'm really happy that the Commission took, in its proposal for the clean energy package, took two, of three, two out of the three recommendations that we made into account. Then the process in the negotiation procedure, the legislative procedures, has delivered a somewhat different picture. And this was one of the most contentious aspects in, in the negotiation between the European Parliament and the Council. Uh, but at least, you know, I think now attention is focused. We were hoping that this could be solved um, quite, no, I wouldn't say immediately, but you know, at, at a fast pace. I still have to read carefully what the final uh, text is, but my impression, having read, it, having read it a couple of times, is that you know, it, it, we will get there, but it will probably take us uh, a few more years. Probably by 2025, we will get something, which, I mean, to an extent, I understand. You can't change things overnight, but I'm not sure we need seven years to do it. But the co legislators know better, as always. So, and I'm not, obviously, in my role, I cannot, you know, we take what it comes. We've been pushing for it. I think actually the industry well, is, is quite worried. I don't know whether any of you have read it, but I think the solution, I would say, if I were a TSO, I would be worried. But <coughs> fortunately, I am not. So, um, now, what are the reasons for, you know, for this um, low level of capacity being made available to cross-border interconnectors? And the problem is that most of the most of the capacity is actually used to, even on the cross-border integration, to take care of internal congestion. So it's limited, in a sense. The, the, there is uh, 85, eight, around 85% of uh, what we see congestion uh, in Europe is actually located inside the countries, and 85% of the consumption of capacity is actually done by uh, internal congestion. So in ten, now, the, the, the definition of bidding zones is one, or price zones, is one where basically to a good degree of approximation you don't have constraints, okay? Because if you have constraints then you should have a different configuration. So you would expect that within each bidding zone you can accept to an approximation because obviously you cannot, otherwise you, we go to nodal. And we may need in, 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 in the end go to nodal. But until we want to, if we want to preserve the, the, the a zonal system, you know, the definition should be such that you know, exchanges within a single zone, um, it's do not uh, do not face limitations. Clearly, this is not the case. Clearly, we have to restrict cross-border in order to maintain or allow uh, internal congestion, internal internal uh, exchanges, and actually most of the congestion is within bidding zones rather than across bidding zones. Now, this is a matter of uh, uh, capacity calculation. As I said, we've, um, we've, um, we've proposed um, new principles. The Commission took them into account. It's also, maybe at some stage, we should be looking in, with, with an open attitude to a bidding zone reconfiguration. Uh, the TSOs in the central part of Europe delivered I think it was a year ago, something like that, a, a, a report on whether we should revisit the, the BD zone configuration. Unfortunately, it was inconclusive. 
I mean, my reading, my very personal reading, is that if you have a large number, a large, a large enough number of metrics, any analysis would be inconclusive. Because you know, if you if you want to achieve everything without any source of prioritization, then it's very difficult. I mean, there is a perception that this is a zero sum game. Uh, this is also something that, unfortunately, in my view, somehow spoiled the spoiled the process. I mean, it is and it is not. Clearly, if you change the bidding zone configuration, there are some players who will win a bit and others will, will lose. I mean, this is all. Even with market coupling, you know, if you put two countries together, the price will go up in the exporting country and the price will go down. So producers in the exporting uh, energy producers in the exporting countries will be happier, energy consumer maybe not that much, and the opposite in the other. I mean, we've, been, we've seen this, but this is, but overall, overall, uh, you increase efficiency. And this is, a, 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 exactly, you know, this is exactly the same. At the moment, there are still around 2 billion euros being spent every year to try to cope with internal congestion or congestion which is not managed, let me be more clear, congestion which is not managed through congestion management. Um, to take care of loop flows, etc. Now, half of it is in Germany, roughly. Now, this is, you know, I've mentioned beforehand, we delivered 1 billion through market capital, and now we're spending 2 billion to try to, co to, to maintain a bidding zone configuration which is probably suboptimal. So I think this is, you know, again, uh, it's political very political. If you see the outcome of uh, the negotiation, you know, this is probably one of the most political aspects. I can understand. I, I, you know, you, you, however, you see that Sweden was forced a few years ago by DJ competition to split into zones. Not much changed. You know, electricity is still there. Norway <coughs> runs with five zones. Italy runs with, uh, I think, six uh, geographical and probably 20 virtual zones. There are ways, if, if your concern is to make sure that every consumer in your country pays the same price, there are ways. In Italy, in New York, uh, there are ways in which you have a, a symmetry between what? Uh, to, between the price signals which are given to generators and the price paid by consumers. This can be done. It's complex, but if this is what we want, this can be done. I fear, well, I fear, I hope and fear that this process will lead to, uh, to nodal pricing, which at the end of the day would be the best, the best outcome anyway. So those who want to protect a zonal system which is at the moment is not delivering may in the end lose the zonal system altogether. And I already, you know, there is already some discussion here of should we go to nodal. In the long term, it may be inevitable. You know, if you have a lot more renewables, you need to, 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 to manage the grid in a more dynamic way. In the long term, it might be inevitable. Uh, and for those who are interested, uh, in fact, fri next Friday, not this Friday, next Friday, uh, at the Florence Rules of Regulation, we're running a seminar exactly on what are the advantages and disadvantages. You can run at the Florence School. At the moment, you can not run in any institutional setting. You know, what would, what would be gain and what would be lost if we were to move, from a technical point of view, if we were to move from a zonal system to a nodal system. And there are a lot of people in, in Europe that say that's inevitable anyway. So, just to give a bit of perspective, we could, we could deal with this much faster than moving to, to a nodal system. But that's where we are. Now, uh, a lot of commentators have actually said, well, we need big zones because this is actually what foster forward liquidity in the market. Now, there is not a strict correlation. Clearly, I mean, the observation of the high liquidity and the large scope of the uh, German zones is, you know, may give this appearance. But if you look more widely, then I'm not sure that you see it. I mean, uh, th 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 there doesn't seem to be this correlation. Clearly, there is a correlation between the churn rate, so the liquidity of the market and the bidder, bidder spread. But whether you know, the, the liquidity of the market is actually uh, promoted by a larger zone, so you have some 
uh, you have some big, quite big countries, you see it on, on the right hand side, quite big countries where the liquidity, the churn rate is not that high. So size is not enough. There are other things, you know, the, the, the efficiency of the market, other things are actually probably more important. But you know, this is just to confute some of the easy, easy, easy solution or easy um, uh, conclusions that people take. Now, I was talking beforehand to, of intraday markets. Um, there's been, there is at the moment quite, quite a debate about intraday markets, you know, what the role should be, um, how they should work. Um, the, the, the target model for intraday market is continuous trading, but with intraday market becoming more and more important, then the issue has emerged. And, you know, should we have a way of pricing capacity in the intraday time frame? Because at the moment, uh, continuous trade, you allocate capacity for free. In the day ahead, where we have market coupling, capacity is priced. But in the in continuous trade, it, it is not. In, in, in the bearing market, you have auctions. But this is not the target model forced over all Europe. Now, this is a very topical um, issue because, as you said, with more and more capacity being, more and more energy being traded in the intraday market, we want to integrate this intraday market. And the XBIT project that I referred to beforehand is actually a way of doing that. And already mentioned that you know there is a lot of activity in the XBIT market. And, uh, and, and so we want to make sure that capacity in the intraday market is allocated efficiency, and that the only way that we know, maybe somebody else knows better, but the only way we know to allocate capacity efficiency efficiently is to rely on price signals. And price signals require market. So what happens? I mean, there, there have been two, two areas which have been all very recently debated quite widely in, in Europe. First of all, do we want to have auctions in this market just to give to have a price a pricing mechanism? And when should we open this market? Um, the initial proposal from TSOs was to open at ten o'clock the day before. Not not so, not the local markets, but the the sharing of the order book across borders. And uh, and ten o'clock ten p.m. 2200 market time, D minus one, it's a bit late, we thought. Uh, I know that there is an issue of capacity calculation after the day ahead market, so I know that you cannot be that ambitious now, but early in the, well, uh, last year, we actually issued a decision because national regulatory authorities could not agree, and then it comes to us, where we said, no, this market should, should open at th um, 1500 market time, D minus one, we, with whichever capacity TSOs will be able to make available. We hope that in the future there will be some capacity. Obviously, there is some capacity left over from the day ahead market. But at least we start putting the, the, the order book together. So if there are needs by market participants to trade in opposite direction, they can do it. So this is something that we have uh, already uh, decided. And if you see... Uh, this is actually, uh, Mebel is, 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 is the red. If we were to wait until 10 p.m. D minus one, we would lose a lot of liquidity. We would lose a large share of liquidity, probably a third in Europe, probably half or more in Italy and, and the Iberian market. So I think there is a good reason why we should insist, we, you know, to support our insistence, in, uh, in, in, in saying, sorry, we, you know, we should open this market quite earlier on. Now, then the issue is uh, how, <coughs> you know, um, how we price this capacity, uh, because it is used. And, uh, the, and this is something that I cannot go in many details, because it's, um, it's a decision that we will adopt next week. But basically, we will have to introduce auctions. Um, I know that in Spain it's not a big deal, because you already have auctions. But in other countries, it is a big deal. And I think there are, there are also some concerns in Spain about having to interrupt one market to give, uh, to give um, you know, the possibility, the auctions, sorry, having to, to, to interrupt continuous trading to give to the possibility of the auctions. But I think this, you know, in, in a sense, we need to have this. And uh, uh, I think on Thursday next week, we will um, adopt a decision. 
where we will introduce sanctions. I mean, we've already consulted, so not a secret. Um, maybe one aspect that uh, was, uh, I think Marina mentioned beforehand, is uh, the capacity mechanism. Um, six of them were uh, a year ago approved by the Commission. We're not, wor I mean, we're worried about a bit about the capacity mechanism per se, even though when we were asked to look at them, I think four or five years ago by the European Parliament, if they're well designed, maybe, you know, they're not, they don't create too much problem to the market. They need to be well designed. And m many of them at the moment, they're not well designed. I think what we are probably more concerned, and sorry, well designed, we, also means allowing cross-border participation, which is now becoming a, a requirement under the clean energy package. What, what we are concerned is on the resource adequacy assessment, because in many countries this is still done without taking into account the contribution of neighboring jurisdictions. And when this is done, Sometimes it's not done in an efficient way, but just in a deterministic way, so, and without coordination. Now here, I think we have two problems. If you don't coordinate this adequacy assessment at regional level, your results are, or your assessment is either ineffective or inefficient. Because if you do not consider, and here, I mean, the, as you see, the country in, uh, in, in, in yellow and in red they are not considering the potential contribution of neighboring countries to their security of supply. Now, if you don't do that, you obviously come up with an inefficient <laughs> outcome because you try to do it all by yourselves while your neighbors could contribute. So this is an inefficient way of handling this problem. If, on the other hand, you consider the contribution that your neighbors could give you in an uncoordinated way, so you, you say, oh, I have neighbors who can help me, but without so checking with them and not making a regional, then you may count on them to the extent that when a crisis comes, it would not be feasible because they may also have a crisis. So you count on their resources. They count on your resources. And when the crisis comes, you, know, you have double counted these resources. And this obviously is an, an, if, an ineffective way of dealing with the problem. So at the moment, we see a lot of ineffectiveness and inefficiencies in the way in which the adequacy, the adequacy assessment is done. The clean energy package is now going from a more regional approach. There are, the devil is always in the details. I hope that you know, this will be implemented properly and that we will soon have a way of doing it efficiently but also in an effective way. I think, again, it's a matter of money at the end of the day and a matter of security of supply, and both things are quite important, because what we have, what we want is to deliver fair prices, consumer, consumers at the end pay everything. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, if you see, in some jurisdictions, the, 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 the share of the final price paid by consumer, which is devoted to paying for capacity mechanism, is quite high. And uh, one has to ask himself or herself, is this really the cheapest way of, of achieving this. Now, I told you that I had another slide with billions. This is another slide with billions. And this is, uh, this is the la last slide on the wholesale electricity market. This is our estimate as to, and when you, come, when you talk about estimates, there is always a degree of uncertainty. But you know, the, the, the order of magnitude, I think, is, 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 is right. Of what we are delivering, what we have been delivering, and what we could deliver more to our consumers in, uh, in Europe from, from the progress in, uh, in, in, in creating an efficient market. So market coupling in the head, already mentioned, a billion, probably there is more to come. Um, uh, the, uh, the market, uh, the intraday market coupling, probably another fraction of a billion. Uh, the, Balancing market integration can deliver. I've actually seen, this is our estimate, I've actually seen estimates, I think from TSOs in the order of 3 billion. Maybe they're right, but it's, again, it's, it's in a matter of billion. And then, if we were able to, and this is something where we're already working, where we, we will be, we need to start working is to improve 
uh, capacity calculation, we should uh, have, as I mentioned before, a coordinated security of supply approach, which means doing a regional assessment. And then the bidding zone reconfiguration, we don't know. But you know, at the moment, if we're spending 2 billion euro just for remedial actions, and the more, the more renewables will come to the market, we, we guess the more problems will appear then this could be a multi-billion issue that I think we should tackle. Right, that's, uh, <coughs> that's for, the, uh, for the wholesale markets. Just to conclude some words about uh, the, the retail market. Good news. For the second year running, uh, prices on average, price paid by our electricity and gas consumers are going down. Um, this, I think, is, is very good news. The other side of the, co and that's both in electricity and gas, we'll see that uh, industrial consumers pay, in general, less than, than uh, residential consumers, but um, you could also claim that, you know, there are good reasons for that. Uh, what the less, the not so good picture, or not so, so good um, uh, outcome is that still the non-contestable part of the tariff is still is, is, is a very large share. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment. Here we see what happened to prices uh, over the last uh, years for electricity uh, and gas for both industrial and residential. As you see on the average Europe, there was a trend. For a long time, we saw wholesale prices going down, but retail prices not following. Retail prices going, still going up. And that has been longer for electricity and for gas. And the reason was that, in, in the meanwhile, the other components of the final price, the non-commodity components, were going up, especially the one not even linked to, to, to say, the networks, um, the renewables. So if you actually, down here you have, you see the, 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 the component of the renewable charge in the final tariff more than doubled over the last five years. Now, this is not a criticism of renewables. I mean, the agency takes a very neutral and obviously we understand that renewables are an essential part of decarbonization of the economy. It's more a matter of what are the implications of the support mechanisms for the retail market. And I think that, you know, we just noticed that um, for, 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 for sometimes consumers were not able to reap the benefits of redu reducing or decreasing or wholesale prices now. Okay, the other, okay, the, the other <laughs> message that we have is that uh, the, re the retail markup uh, is actually finally decreasing. For a long time, as I said, there was a divergence between wholesale and retail prices. Finally, the market is delivering. The competition in, this, in the retail um, in the retail sector is actually delivering better prices which are more aligned with, uh, with wholesale prices. We, we used to produce uh, the so-called RC index, the Agency Retail Competition Index. We, ha we had to discontinue it two years ago because we, we ran out of resources. The agency, maybe I'll have a word later on, the agency is actually suffering from very severe resource limitation. This is, the, this is the picture that I mentioned beforehand, which is something that we, produ we produce every year, as to the share, I mean, this is clearly, it's not in absolute term, this is the share, the share of, uh, uh, of uh, the commodity uh, component in, in the total price. And uh, as we see at the moment for gas, this share is below 50%. So the commodity component only accounts for 50%, and then we have other, other components, some of them fully justified, obviously. I would say all of them fully justified. But all, obviously, there are some implications uh, for, uh, the, wait, sorry, for, uh, for the way in which consumers see the pr their prices. If we look at electricity, the picture is even more starking. Only a third, roughly, of what we pay on average is, is actually coming from the cost of energy. And as you see at the top, there is the increasing um, uh, cost for renewables. Um, a couple of final slides. Um, 
our, which may not be of great relevance to you, but just to make, just to give an indication that Europe is beyond, it goes beyond the European Union, and that we look also at other jurisdictions. Uh, um, for, uh, since last year, we also covered the energy community, the contracting parties. Some of them are looking at acceding to Europe, not in, in I don't think this will happen in, you know, immediately. So we've been looking at the dynamics of prices and uh, we see um, that uh, household electricity prices have been increased in most countries, uh, especially in Ukraine. Ukraine had a real, they had a price structure which I think came from the past, which was really uh, non-conducive. They had very low prices and they made reforms. Uh, I think the gas price increased by 170% overnight, something like that. So obviously there was um, some problems there. But they're trying, this country, I think the message that comes here is that this country are making an effort to make sense of their, their markets. So if these countries are making an effort coming from situations which were really not market driven until very recently, I think ourselves in the European Union should try to also do our homework and we should also try to deliver to consumers the benefit that they deserve. Because at the end of the day, what we, the whole process, the third package, the implementation of the network codes, um, the clean energy package, the next package, are not for, 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 for the agency, are not for TSOs, for regulators, for companies. They are for consumers. I mean, if we not, cannot deliver the benefit to consumers, then we have failed. And I think this is the only test that matters, uh, whether we are able to deliver not necessarily lower prices, because prices have to do with a lot of things. You know, have to do with uh, the conditions on the international energy market. But fairer prices, more choice, and greater security of supply. And in this respect, fair prices, our activity in Remit is also, even though it's not that visible, I understand, but it's also quite important uh, to make sure that there is no abusive behavior in the market, uh, that it is not the, only detected, but also discouraged. There is deterrence there. And I have to say that Spain paved the way, I think it was 2015, when there was, that was not really Remit. I mean, I think it was in the transition process from pre-Remit to Remit. Uh, I think it's still in the courts, uh, the, 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 the large fine uh, that the CM, CNMC uh, imposed on a major um, player. Uh, there was another significant fine um, last year in France, five million for market abuse of the gas market. And now we see more and more regulators taking it seriously. We've taken it very seriously, but obviously we only have you know, um, a responsibility for analyzing the market, monitoring, screening, and highlighting. At the moment we are disseminating around between 15 and 80 alerts every month to national regulators, issues that we notice in the internal market which we find it strange. And having looked into them, we find them a bit even more than strange. And so at, there are, at the moment there are around 100, and, at, actually at the end of last year there were 150 cases opening um, in Europe, most of them obviously dealt by national regulators. That is also an important part of the market. Because uh, now that we're trying to make the markets more efficient, we want to make sure that they're not rigged by abusive behavior. Uh, so going back to something that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, resources. I know this is boring. Uh, and we are a small, we, we are still very small in Europe. We are, at the moment, we are 120 in Ljubljana. So it's a small, small body. However, we've been struggling with resources since I would say since Remit. Uh, this year, we risked having to suspend market monitoring in Remit because we could not even afford the licenses for the software. This is how bad it gets, let alone getting enough people. You know. And what are we talking about? We were asking for 20 million for this year. The, initially, the proposal from the Commission was 16. The Council came in with a proposal for 30 million. So what we're talking about, you know, it's plus or minus six million, three millions if you take the commission. Now, for me, three million euros is a, a lot of money. You know. <laughs> Big. 
But if you think that, you know, if you... Uh, we don't have a lot of experience in Europe. We only see the first cases coming up. And we've seen, as I said, the, the French regulator fining 5 million euros uh, for manipulating the gas market. I have been told that it has been appealed. I haven't seen it officially. It will go to administrative court. We'll see what happens. Uh, I think also the one in Spain is still under review, I believe. But I want to say something is happening. And when, we, when you see cases, you know, you see cases in the order of many millions. I mean, FERC in the US, and I'm sorry if I, but I think everybody should be aware of the perspective. FERC last year, sorry, not, 18 is not yet available, 17 the last year that is available, they imposed uh, fines in the order of 50 million US dollar and another 50 million, I think, in terms of disgorged profits, profits that have been done through market manipulation, which market players are asked to return or forced to return to the market. A few years ago, there were high profile investigations with uh, well known names, I think it was JP Morgan, Barclays, Constellation Energy, a billion in fines and 370 million US dollars in disgorged profits. So this is the kind of, I'm not, I'm not claiming for a moment that the market in, 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 in Europe is being abused to the same extent. However, we see things coming up. What I'm saying, by investing five, six million, you can recover some of it through fines, if you find something, but even if you were not, not finding something, because the deterrence effect is sufficient to avoid, you know, the value of confidence that consumer can have on the fact that the price they pay are the right ones, <coughs> and that all traders in the market, they trade on the basis of the same set of information, so there is no trade ba trading basis. So to me, is much higher than five, <coughs> five million, okay? So, I hope that, uh, you know, things will improve for the agency. In my nine years with the agency, this has been one of the greatest challenge, and every year we had to fight, and every year we weren't sure whether we would survive the next year with our activities. We're starting now the, the fight for 2020, and then my successor will start the fight for 2021. I believe we, find a, we, we need a final solution. Now with clean energy, uh, 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 sorry, not a final solution, a stable solution. Now with clean energy package, we will be allowed to raise fees from remit, uh, reporting parties. It's, it's, it's a good signal, but it's only part of the, of the story. Remit is only part of what we do. There is a lot more. What I presented today has nothing to do with remit, and there is still you know, a lot of what we do um, in, in other areas. So, if you have whatever opportunity to voice this concern, which I think is, should be not just our concern, but a shared concern, I will be most grateful. And thank you very much again for this opportunity to be here today. Thank you.